Greetings, fellow traveler. On the journey of discipleship, we've been given a profound gift in the practice of the spiritual disciplines. These habits, practices, and intentional experiences, inherited from two millennia of faithful discipleship, help strengthen our relationship with God, expand our understanding of God's love and grace, and challenge us to more fully enflesh what we've learned in the world. In the Invitation to Spiritual Disciplines video series, the Discipleship Ministries team of Foundry United Methodist Church offers you short, simple, and practical information about unique spiritual disciplines and how you can engage them to grow in your love for God and others and draw strength from their practice for your own journey of discipleship. I'm Daryl Davis, and today I want to speak with you about using poetry as a spiritual discipline. What on earth does poetry have to do with theology? Well, Jews and Christians after them have been speaking, writing, and singing poetry from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created. In poetry. At least, that is the language that the authors of Genesis chapter 1 use. Jesus often taught in memorable lines of poetry himself. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The Psalms, the Book of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Book of Job, and much of the books of the prophets is all poetry. Who hasn't been stirred by the familiar words of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Or, by the imagery of what is surely the most famous poem in the Bible, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. In fact, nearly a third of the Bible is poetry, which may be why some parts of it are easier to remember than others. Poetry has played a large role in the formation and articulation of Christian theology outside of the Bible, too. Just think of the founders of Methodism, John and Charles Wesley. John wasn't great at writing poetry, but he did see its uses for the church and edited volumes of poetry for that purpose, including a version of John Milton's Paradise Lost. His brother Charles turned his poems into hymns, nearly 6,000 of them. You've probably sung some of the better-known ones, such as, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. There's a long tradition in Christianity of writers doing theology and practicing their faith through poetry, from Dante in 14th century Italy to John Milton in Puritan England to figures closer to our own time, like Emily Dickinson, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Howard Thurman, Denise Levertov, Wendell Berry, and many, many others. Sometimes these writers are creating devotional poetry. That is, poetry specifically meant for private or public worship, prayer, and meditation. At other times, poetry becomes a way of asking theological questions, of honestly wrestling with doubt, expressing emotions that don't neatly fit into the boxes of academic theology or church doctrine. In fact, poetry explodes these boxes, taking us deep into the theological imagination, touching our hearts and not only our heads. It helps us understand the symbolic nature of religious language itself, the rich images and metaphors that speak to our very souls, the Lord as a shepherd, Jesus as the bread of life, water which tastes like eternity. Poetry makes us slow down, retrace our steps, dive down deeply, and see things from different perspectives. Jesus as a mother hen? That's the image used in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, describing Jesus' longing to bring the inhabitants of Jerusalem together, quote, as a mother hen brings her brood under her wings, unquote. 
I'd like to invite you now to explore several poems that offer the opportunity to practice some basic spiritual disciplines, and which may enhance and enrich your own devotional life. Denise Levertov's What the Fig Tree Said is a poem taken straight out of Scripture. The backdrop is a famous and perplexing story in the book of Mark, chapter 11, where Jesus curses a fig tree because it doesn't have any fruit on it, and Jesus is hungry. In Levertov's hands, what might have been a dry theology lesson becomes a journey into the imagination, as the fig tree itself describes the incident from its point of view, the point of view of Christ the poet, who curses not the tree itself, but the dullness of his disciples' imaginations. They who cannot imagine the fruits of the kingdom of God, and therefore don't know how to bring them forth. A Roman Catholic, Levertov was familiar with the tradition of Ignatian spirituality, which invites us to imagine ourselves participating in specific episodes in the life of Christ. As you hear this poem read aloud, close your eyes and imagine yourself with the disciples. Are there places in your life which are also barren? Where Christ would have you bring forth fruit, if only you could imagine that possibility. What the Fig Tree Said by Denise Levertov Literal minds, embarrassed humans, his friends were blurting for him in secret. Wouldn't admit they were shocked. They thought him petulant to curse me. Yet how could the Lord be unfair? So they looked away. Then and now. But I, I knew that helplessly barren though I was, my day had come. I served Christ, the poet who spoke in images. I was at hand, a metaphor for their failure to bring forth what is within them as figs were not within me. They who had walked in his sunlight presence, they could have ripened, could have perceived his thirst and hunger, his innocent appetite. They could have offered human fruits, compassion, comprehension without being asked, without being told of need. My absent fruit stood for their barren heart. So he cursed, not me, not them, but eyes that see not, ears that hear not, cursed their dullness that withholds gifts unimagined. Other of Levertov's biblical poems are less capricious, but no less imaginatively engaging. In Salvator Mundi via Crucis, that is, Savior of the World by the Cross, Levertov reflects on the different ways Christ has been depicted over the centuries, by famous artists like Rembrandt and by those whose names we'll never know. What none of them have captured, Levertov thinks, is what she imagines was Jesus' greatest temptation in the garden as he faced arrest and torture, the betrayal of friends and death on the cross. It was to simply give up and cease to be. In this poem, Levertov invites us to be there with Jesus in the garden and to sweep away our preconceptions of power or triumph to imagine instead a man as vulnerable to the slings and arrows of life as we are. What resources do we call on in our hour in that garden? Where do we find God in that moment? As you listen, imagine yourself with Christ in the garden. 
Salvatore Mundi, Via Crucis, by Denise Levertov. Maybe he looked indeed, much as Rembrandt envisioned him, in those small heads that seem in fact portraits of more than a model. A dark, still young, very intelligent face, a soul mirror gaze of deep understanding, unjudging. That face, in extremis, would have clenched its teeth in a grimace not shown in even the great crucifixions. The burden of humanness, I begin to see, exacted from him, that he taste also the humiliation of dread, cold sweat of wanting to let the whole thing go, like any mortal hero, out of his depth, like anyone who has taken herself back. The painters, even the greatest, don't show how, in the midnight garden, or staggering uphill under the weight of the cross, he went through with even the human longing to simply cease, to not be. Not torture of body, not the hideous betrayals humans commit, nor the faithless weakness of friends, and surely not the anticipation of death, not then in agony's grip, was incarnation's heaviest weight, but the sickened desire to renege, to step back from what he, who was God, had promised himself and had entered time and flesh to enact. Sublime acceptance to be absolute had to have welled up from those depths where purpose drifted for mortal moments. We can imagine ourselves with Christ as Levertov does, but there are times in each of our lives when we feel utterly bereft of God, or that God is simply not listening. The late poet and Anglican priest R.S. Thomas was a master at expressing honest doubt in his poems, listening for God and always hoping that God was listening for him. In the poem Kneeling, Thomas is back at it feeling like an actor on a divine stage, waiting for his cue. But he wonders, is the message in the waiting itself? In the act of prayer itself? Regardless of how or when or whether it is answered. As you hear this poem, you might reflect on your own devotional life and what prayer means to you. Does prayer have to be answered? at least in a way that can be understood in order to be valid? Are you ready for God's prompt if it comes? Kneeling by R. S. Thomas Moments of great calm Kneeling before an altar of wood in a stone church in summer, waiting for the God to speak. The air, a staircase for silence. The sun's light ringing me as though I acted a great role. The audiences still. All that close throng of spirits waiting as I for the message. Prompt me, God, but not yet. When I speak, though it be you who speak through me, something is lost. The meaning is in the waiting. Sometimes we meet God in unexpected places. Poets have found God expressed in the beauty of nature, and whole theologies have been built around that. We'll close this invitation to exploring God through the poets with another sample from R.S. Thomas. In the Moor, nature itself is the sanctified ground where God is met and worshipped. It was like a church to me, the poet writes. Words with a deep echo for us in a time of pandemic. The poet approaches reverently, expectantly. 
God is felt, not heard. The poet attentively listens, but does not volubly pray. After the encounter, whatever exactly it was, he walks on, refreshed and renewed. The final image of the poem, of air crumbling and breaking generously as bread, references both the Eucharist or communion and the life-saving manna from heaven. It's God's provision, here with a man, alone, on a moor. As you listen to this poem, reflect on the places outside of the church edifice itself where you have met God. Have the months of pandemic offered opportunities to find God in other places or other people? Are there specific places or specific actions and activities where you meet God? The Moor by R. S. Thomas It was like a church to me. I entered it on soft foot, breath held like a cap in the hand. It was quiet. What God was, there made himself felt, not listened to, in clean colors that brought a moistening of the eye, in movement of the wind over grass. There were no prayers said, but stillness of the heart's passions. That was praise enough, and the mind's session of its kingdom. I walked on, simple and poor, while the air crumbled and broke on me generously as bread. Finally, we invite you to practice on your own, using poetry for devotional exercise, for prayer, to ask questions, or as a means of having a conversation with God. Here are three examples you might use and suggestions for engaging with each. Stay tuned for the next installment of Exploring God Through the Poets. In the meantime, please visit our resources page and let us know how these things have been helpful to you. Friends, we are so glad that you found this video resource, and we pray that it has been and will continue to be a source of strength for you in the discipleship journey. Foundry's discipleship ministries are committed to providing you the resources you need to sustain a lifelong journey of discipleship in which you can live ever more deeply into God's love for you and the world as modeled by Jesus. If this video has been a gift for you, or if you're interested in finding new ways to learn, grow, and go deeper into the work of discipleship throughout life, please email us at discipleship at foundryumc.org and let us know how we can be your companions along the way. Until then, and as always, blessings on the journey.